You're listening to Market Champions, a podcast on navigating the financial markets. Here's your host, Shabas Prakash. This episode of Market Champions is brought to you by Simplify ETFs. For more information, visit simplify.us. No Simplify funds will be discussed during this podcast. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Market Champions. I just wanted to remind you to like, subscribe, and leave a comment. Really helps the page grow, really helps the podcast grow. Thank you so much for your support. And now on to the interview. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Market Champions. Today we've got Kevin Muir. Kevin Muir's previously been on the show. I think it was like a year back. So, you know, it's awesome to have you on once again. Kevin's the author of the Macro Tourist Letter. He hosts the second best finance podcast after mine, of course. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. So he owes one of he owes one of the best finance podcasts out there, The Market Huddle with Patrick Ceresna. It's one of my favorites. I listen to it every single week. So uh, it's fantastic. It's very kind of you, Sri. It's, it is fantastic. Um, and, and listen, before we start, Sri, I actually, I would love to hear um, how you enjoyed your summer at Simplify. For those who don't know, Sri got a job working with Simplify with Mike Green and the boys. And uh, how was it? Yeah, it's, it's been absolutely wonderful uh, at Simplify. So Simplify is, um, this is Simplify for those of you who don't know, is an ETF, uh, is an ETF provider. And they basically incorporate options and other uh, asymmetric exposures within those ETFs. And you know, it's been awesome working with people like Mike Green, Harley Bassman, the entire yeah. product simplifies like super duper smart. I've learned a lot personally. Well, and, that's uh, terrific. And how is school going? School's going, uh, school's going okay. Um, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I, uh, you know, I've d- d- done embarrassing you enough. Let's get into it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So Kevin, you know, for those of her, you know, for our listeners who might not know, could you sort of give a synopsis of your background? You know, you sort of started on the prop desk back in the day. And, you know, yeah. you sort of has a, so could you just give a synopsis of your journey? Sure, no problem. So uh, I was, uh, I also went to UT like you three. And uh, when I was there, I started working at the Bank of Montreal Investor Line, which was their discount stock brokerage division. And I, I proceeded to be a manager there while I was going to school. And I said, hey, this isn't what I want to do. So I actually quit that. And I gave a whirl at uh, trying to trade in Chicago on the pits. And I didn't like that at all. And I came back to Toronto. And I was lucky enough to get a job on the RBC Dominion Securities Institutional Equity Desk. And when I first started, I was actually on the equity desk as opposed to the derivatives desk. Um, as my boss likes to joke, he said there was guys that were better at, at trading. There was guys that were better at computers, but I had the right mix of both. Okay. And I was uh, at a time when uh, indexing and program trading was just starting off. I was lucky to be there. And RBC was is in, as still is a terrific firm, very entrepreneurial. They allowed people to run with the ball and young people like myself. And I was lucky enough to be there during the dot-com and the long-term capital and the whole nine yards. And uh, I went from originally just being a a program trader that would handle all of the index uh, files and the index trades to eventually being the, uh, the chief risk taker in terms of the equity derivatives book. And uh, it was a great time. I had a, had a blast. And then in 2000, I uh, quit and went to trade for myself. And I've been doing that for the past couple of decades. It's awesome. And, you know, as you've, you know, uh, you know, you've sort of, you've, you've sort of lived through, you know, number one, the dot, dot com bubble. But then after that, you've also sort of, uh, you know, this is as a personal trader, as a, uh, yeah. you know, someone trading for yourself, you live through the housing bubble and, you know, you're living through what's going on right now. So <laughs> now before we get there, you know, do you have, what was it like, you know, actually working on a trading floor and do you have any like funny war stories or? Sure. Or- uh, it was, a, it was a lot of fun and, and, and I'll, I miss it tremendously. When people used to ask me when I left the bank and I was no longer on the desk, they said, what do you miss most? And I said, I missed two things. The first thing was that I had gone from being uh, having the bank's balance sheet and trading big size, and uh, you know, setting the price for blocks and and being a you know being a real player on some trades, and to the point where people would phone me up and say, "We're going up on a million of this. Do you want any?" And I say, "Well, I'll buy ten 
thousand, but I understand if you don't want to write up the ticket because you know at ten thousand I was just getting in the way of, of the blocks, and I understood what little what little pain in the ass clients were like back then. So I was trying to stay out of the way. So I missed being the trading size, and then the other thing I missed was the camaraderie on the desk. And uh, I'll just tell you a, a brief story in terms of one of the things that I wrote about recently or I didn't write about it recently, I highlighted it recently, was the fact that I'm always confused of why people get so emotionally attached uh, to trades, to positions, and they get on Twitter or they get on TV, whatever it be, and they start just going after each other about the trade and all this, all this nonsense. And I don't know if it's a function of being on a desk and understanding that every single one of my trades, there was somebody on the other side because I saw them. I knew them. I knew it was Ontario teachers I was selling this to, or I knew that it was uh, Canada pension plan, whatever it was. I knew there was somebody on the other side of my trade. And I understood that for us to have a trade, we had to have differing opinions, whether it be I thought it was going to go down in the next 10 minutes or I thought it was going to go down for the next 10 years. It doesn't matter. We had differing opinions. And because of this, I've always been uh, very aware that, uh, you know, there's no sense arguing about things. Ultimately, you take your, you, you, you express your view in the marketplace. And I'm, I just find, I get onto FinTwit and, I, and it just drives me nuts how I see people sitting and arguing about trade deficits, uh, QE or whatever. And I'm like, who cares? Place your bets. And then ultimately your checkbook is going to be what says, you know, who's right or who's wrong. And uh, so I tell the story of, uh, I was laughing because uh, uh, there was a fellow on the desk by the name of Tony D and Tony was, or no, sorry, Tony O, Tony O. And he was a great, great trader. And one day uh, it was late in 99 when the market was just starting to wobble a little. And we had one of those mornings where we got up and the market was down 3% and it was, there was selling everywhere and we were just getting pasted and you were long and it was just ugly and the phone was ringing and, you know, everyone was selling. And Tony D all of a sudden, or Tony O, sorry, I keep calling him Tony D, sorry. Tony O all of a sudden says, I'm an up better. And what he was saying was he wanted to bet on the market closing up on the day. And even though it was down 3%, he wanted to bet on it closing up. And he said he wanted seven to one odds. And I thought about it and it's like, oh, seven to one is the wrong price. But nobody wanted to trade with him. You know, he's just kind of, he's a pretty great trader. And he thinks it's going up and nobody wants the other side. So I kind of calculated in my head and I say, well, it comes at four to one, meaning that I'll do the trade at four to one. And he says, well, I'll tell you what, six, 200 pays 1,200, which means it was six to one. And I said, well, how about, you know, 200 pays 1,000 and we'll do, and you're on. And, and so we did the trade. And sure enough, next thing I know, the market was almost, it was actually up on the day and it was sweating it. I was sweating it out, but luckily the bulls sent it up too quickly. And by the end of the day, they had, they had pulled it back and it closed down 50 basis points or something like it wasn't very much, but I, I squeaked out a win. And one of the things that I just, I, I, I want everyone to understand and I like to try to reinforce is that, you know, we were traders, two different traders, two different opinions, and there's a price for everything. And when we had a disagreement about something in terms of when we thought one person thought that the stock was going up, the other thought the other one was going down, we used to have an expression. We say, see you in the machine, meaning that we would go and actually do a trade in the machine. And I think that too often on FinTwit and in, in, on CNBC and all the media places, they're so busy arguing and, they, and, it, and it's a debating society. And I have no desire to be in a debating society I welcome people being on the other side of my trades. Ultimately, the, 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 uh, the wonderful, witty James Grant, he wrote, um, successful investing is have everyone agree with you later. And that's the key point is later. If everyone agrees with you right now, that means that the trade's not very good because ultimately there's nobody left to buy. So I don't know. I, I, Sri, I kind of, uh, I, I've noticed a lot of animosity and a lot of problems and a lot of fighting on Twitter. It kind of makes me sad because... Uh, true traders, they don't bother fighting. They just go and they uh, meet them in the machine. 100%. Because you, you see, you, you know, you see it all the time. You know, you've got the gold books thinking they're right, and then you've got the Bitcoiners thinking they're right, and then, you know, you've got the inflationists and you've got the deflationists. And yeah, <laughs> but listen, the Bitcoiners, everyone that was skeptical, that was to their benefit. The fact that it was that, that idiots like me wouldn't buy the thing, they were better off. That meant that there was more for them to buy. 
yep. at a lower price. And if everyone agreed and everyone thought it was a great investment, it would no longer be a great investment. Yep, 100%. And you know, do you think making money as a trader was easier back then versus now? Oh. Or would you this say- is a, This is, is another one of my pet peeves, three. <laughs> everyone says, oh, you know, if I was uh, back in the 90s, if I was on the desk, it would have been so easy. I would have done all those trades and I would have done all these things. And I, and I tell you, I, so for example, I did one of the first interlisted arbitrage machines, meaning that I would go and we wrote a program that would do, that would buy in Toronto and sell the stock in New York and lock in the arbitrage. And up until that point, it was all done by hand. And we figured out we could do it in the machine. And we ended up being one of the biggest traders uh, on the street through this machine. And I actually have a funny story that ITG was, which is a big, uh, electronic house, uh, our saleswoman told me one time, she said that uh, she went into a meeting and the, the head of the CEO of, of uh, ITG came in and said, everyone guess who the biggest client was this month. And everyone was guessing like CAP or FIDO and all these big clients. And they go, nope, RBC DS machine number three. And it was our <laughs> interlisted ARB machine had just, it was doing so much business because at that point there was no... Um, the Americans hadn't figured it out is the long and short of it. The Americans were just trading on their exchange. So we didn't have big shops to compete with. And it was, it was terrific and it made a lot of money. But the point was that at that time, very few people had the skills to do it. Very few people had the uh, understanding and uh, the technical know-how. And then, and then the kind of balance sheet to do it. And so one of the things is that when I was trying to do that, it was really difficult to get it through. I remember my big boss saying, why are you doing that? I have 13 guys doing that already. And I said, well, the machine's going to do it. So the point is that that machine made us a lot of money. It was a great trade. It was, it was a wonderful opportunity, but it wasn't easy. Yeah. It wasn't easy by a long shot. We were writing stuff in Unix on uh, a scripting language. It was, there was all sorts of issues in terms of figuring things out. And even once we figured it out, we get run over on different things. And um, when you look back at trades, they always seem easier than they were. They always, always seem easier. Like, for example, the Japanese yen when Abenomics came. At the time, I remember it. I remember being on the trade. I remember doing it. And then I remember taking it off because it had gone too far too fast. And in hindsight, it seems really easy to say, oh, yeah, that was so obvious it was going to go that far. But the reality is that it's tough to hang on. And so when I hear people telling me that it was so much easier back then and, and they would have made so much money, I call BS and I contend that there is the equivalent of me with my machine somewhere out there today. And that person's not saying anything. That person's not advertising it. I wasn't telling everyone as my machine made all that money. There's somebody out there doing the exact same thing. It is trading is always, always difficult and it always looks simple in hindsight. And, and, it, and that will always be the case. You'll always, you'll always hear, oh, if only I was around 10 years ago. And, and Sri, you, you mark my words, there will be a time when someone will ask you, oh, geez, it must have been so easy in the 2020s. You were so lucky to be trading at this time. I will keep that in mind for sure. <laughs> But you watch it, someone will do it to you. And you'll remember, you'll say, Kev told me, warned me this would happen. 100%. But would you say that, you know, from a structural standpoint, you know, back then, you know, you didn't have central banks, you know, worrying about 25% basis, uh, 25 basis, 0.25% uh, hikes, you know, two years from now, you know, you, I guess there were more surprises in a way and central banks, uh, central banks, you know, weren't like dovish all the time. Do you think, do you think that has, do you think that sort of structural change has made it harder or do you think that? I, I, I think it's changed it. It hasn't made it harder or easier. It's just changed it. And the one thing you have to count on is that it's always changing. The game will forever and ever, ever always be changing. And one of the great things about true, um, true masters of this craft, you'll see them adapt. And so when I see someone that's nailed one trade and there's all sorts of traders out there that you'll see nailed the, the housing bubble and then went on to be bearish forever and really never have another great trade. Yep. I'm always much more impressed with the people like Paul Tudor Jones and uh, Bruce Ka uh, Ka uh, Caxton. Cov is, Covner. is that right? Bruce sorry? Covner. Covner from Caxton. You're right. I'm sorry. I got it, I got it mixed up. People that have figured out ways 
to adapt and to be able to make money in different environments, that are the true masters. Those are the people that have figured this game out and able to do it. And it's hard. It's hard because you'll have, uh, you'll find that at times the people that are most suited for the particular environment will do the best. So right now, whoever is making all sorts of money in this bull market is, is probably not the, the best overall trader. It's whoever is programmed to be the most aggressive on the long side. And I can't remember in the Market Wizards, there was a story uh, of one of these traders that was uh, wanted to get bull, bullish on the stock market. And at the time, he was worried that he wasn't going to pick stocks that were aggressive enough. So he hired a couple of young kids because he said they were too, like they hadn't had the, the pain to know any better. And it's a little bit like right now, there's a whole bunch of new traders in the market and they're buying AMC, GME, all these stocks at ridiculous valuations. And they don't know the pain of getting hurt yet. They don't have 1999 in their mind. They, 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 it's, to them, it's not there. And for now they're correct. And, but I suspect that over the long run, you'll find that as a group, this group will lose. Yep. And that is something I do feel strongly about. And I, you know, all you can do is hope that you're not, well, not hope, plan so that you're not one of them. But as a group, this group will lose. Yep. And, you know, as you mentioned, 1999 in bull markets, you, know, you had this rolling bubbles thesis. And yeah. have you ever seen, you know, so many like 10 baggers in such a short period of time? Is it, is it getting ridiculous? Is it like getting scary? Are you, see, are you sort of, do you see like uh, parallels to what it was like in the late 1990s, right before the dot-com crash? So I do think it's a lot like 1999. And I did start that, my, my rolling bubble thesis three. I actually looked it up because I was wondering when I had first coined that term. And it was a long time ago. It was, I think it was 2013 or something. It was a wow. long, long time ago that I started talking about this. And for those who don't know what it basically... The thesis is that because you have all of these hedge funds and aggressive traders trying to make limited alpha, like there's, it's limited out, there's limited alpha out there, what you end up happening, what ends up happening is that you'll get uh, an, an idea, a thesis, an investment theme, for example, and a smart uh, hedge fund manager or portfolio manager will buy it, then they'll tell their friends then, you know, so what will happen is it'll start going up because everyone, they're all buying it. Then they'll go and start talking about it on TV and it'll go up even more. And then you'll get all the, the technicians and everyone in there. And it, and it ends up being these mini bubbles that often took anywhere from six months to a year. And eventually what would occur is you get this point of maximum saturation when there was no one left to buy and then the thing would just collapse in on itself and they would go to the next theme. And I've noticed that this is occurring on a more regular basis. It started in, like, as I said, I noticed it in 2013, but it's gotten way worse recently. COVID has made, not COVID, the fiscal response to COVID has made the violence of the moves um, through the roof. And so to some extent, 1999 was crazy. There's no doubt about it. Um, I, I recently wrote a piece kind of reminding people about the NASDAQ in 1998 and 1999. I think in November and December of 98, it went up 80%. I, I don't have the numbers on the tip of my tongue, fingers here, but, and then it proceeded to go up another 60% in November and December of 99. So for those that are getting bearish, listen, I, I understand the rationale behind getting bearish. Just be aware that this could get really stupid. It's just kind of stupid now and it could get really stupid. Um, but I will say that those, back in 99, it felt like there was more logic behind it. This, this one feels a little stranger in that it's hard to make the case that AMC is a good buy, and yet it, it's doing what it is. It's hard to make the case that GME is this wonderful company that deserves that multiple. Like Tesla, at least I get, like you could argue they're gonna 
grow into being this dominant, terrific, you know, TV company that, 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 is, that is monstrous. These other companies, there's no way that GME yeah. and AMC is going to work. It's just the question is, in the meantime, they, we have all these, the, what do they call themselves, apes? I don't understand <laughs> why they call themselves apes, but the apes are in there and they're just keep buying it. And it's just, it's kind of flabbergasting. And uh, so have I ever seen um, this much 10 baggers? No. And then the other thing I will say, and I'm going to sound like a cranky old man here yelling at clouds, but I'm going to say it anyways. <laughs> I, I am flabbergasted at the abuses of kind of what securities laws that are, that, is, that are happening. And, and I, like, I just, let's just take the world's richest man. He basically told the SEC to relatio him and they, and nobody said anything. Like it's, it's kind of just shocking to me. And you might argue, well, that's just, that's just a, an opinion. It's just, it might not be smart, but it, it's not illegal, but there's other things that have been done. You know, the 420 bid, you know, funding secured, all sorts of things. And I, I really do believe that that 420 the bid funding secured set the tone for the next couple of years. And when people saw Elon not getting in that much trouble for that, it's kind of like, you know, when you go to school and there's a, there's a, a substitute teacher and then one of the class, you know, clown throws something. And then all of a sudden you realize that he doesn't get any into trouble. Everyone else realizes they're not, you know, yeah. everyone degrades. And I really do feel that um, this has been abusive in, in a way that, that, is, that we never saw before. Sure, we had chat groups and things like that, but we didn't have people getting on YouTube and promoting stuff. And, and the, the shocking part about it is, they're just open about it. Like people will talk about stuff being like a Ponzi. I remember Dave Port and I got on there. He started talking about one of his uh, crap coins or whatever they call these things, how it's, it's, it's a Ponzi, it's, 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 it's worthless, but you, what you key is to be early in the Ponzi. And that, now that's like an investment thesis. And to me, that's what's really, truly different between this and 1999. I think that was I think that was perfect. And <laughs> and you know, would you say that, you know, at least from like a bubble standpoint, you know, would you would you sort of say uh, like uh, would you say that bubbles are sort of regional and you know, the stuff like AMC and GME, you know, to an extent some of the EV and the new economy companies, you know, you're seeing something like the find uh, like something like Lemonade Inc., for example. Or would you say like, you know, the entire market as a whole is is starting to get a little bubbly? I mean, you get you can easily argue uh, it's Sort of an easier argument to argue something like crypto, you know, uh, you know, there's a lot of these quote unquote shit coins that are that are just flying through the roof, and you know, you're seeing the rise of NFTs, which may or may not have value in say you know five years. But would you say that you know over this, uh, you know, speaking from like an equity standpoint, would you say that overall the equity market is in a bit of a mania or in a bit of a bubble, or do you think you know the typical argument that lower yield sort of invalidates that? So I, I think it has bubbly characteristics, but I, I'm not sure that you should go and be fading it. And, and that's the key. Um, a lot of times people will get up and start talking about a bubble and how this is going to end badly and yada, yada, yada. I'm, I'm not as sure that this bubble is as undeserved as the bears make it out to be. And the reason for that is that there is a tremendous amount of fiscal stimulus in the system. And we do not understand what this means for the economy and for the markets going forward. And I would be really hesitant to, to stand in here and say, this is going to end badly. I'm going to short everything here because I think it's going to collapse. And I'd just like to remind everyone that during the March 2020 COVID crisis, there was all sorts of very prominent uh, portfolio managers, uh, traders, talking about how this was going to end badly and this was going to collapse and we were going to have the world's greatest you know, decline in the stock market. And what happened was that the government through 
monetary, but more importantly, fiscal means filled the hole. And they filled that hole and we've forgotten now how bearish everyone was, but they were, they were super bearish at the bottom there. And they filled the hole and what's happened is it's almost like they filled the hole and they actually made it a little mound up at the top. Like they filled it too much and there's too much money out there right now. And, but the thing about this is that it's worrisome to get too bearish because many of the bearish arguments are based upon ultimate deflation because we can't afford the, to print any, not print, to spend anymore. And that's the important thing, to spend anymore. And one of the things that I think has been laid to rest is that the government can spend as much as they want, and it's not necessarily going to cause a crisis like Ken Rogoff and Carmen Reinhart said in their book, This Time is Different. And the realization that that's the case leads me to think that the real risk is not that we end up spending too little and we have deflation, but rather just the opposite that we end up spending too much and we have inflation. So I, I, I'm more scared of the right tail, meaning that the tail of things exploding in price than I am of the left tail, meaning of things imploding because of deflation. And yes, the thing about Sri is you gotta remember is that we're gonna have moments where we pull back on the spending. And maybe that's one of them right now. Maybe the government's pulling back and we're spending less. But when you look at the longer term picture, there's no doubt that COVID was the tipping point in a change in attitude about government spending. And I don't see that going back. Now, if, they, if it did go back, if we had a, a, you know, if the Tea Party got into power and we started balancing books, I would change my tune. But to me, it looks like if anything, we're headed more in that direction, not less. Yep. And, you know, as you mentioned, fiscal spending, you know, the last time you were on, you know, you were sort of talking about the fact that, you know, you were actually in, in the inflation camp as opposed to, I guess, the disinflation or the deflation camp. And you sort of, yeah, you, you know, you were sort of talking about, number one, the, uh, as you mentioned, the big increase in fiscal spending. So are you still on that thesis? And, you know, how do you, how do you actually go about playing uh, the inflation thesis because inflation has sort of been elevated for the last few months and sort of the right. usual the usual hedge has been gold but gold has pretty much done nothing so yes uh, it's 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 stunk basically ever exactly. since um ever since ross gerber called it the easiest trade in a, in a decade or something i think <laughs> ross gerber managed to top tick the gold market last august when he said it was the easiest trade in the in a, in a long long time and uh that clown, anyway, so let's not get going on him. Um, okay, so how do you play it, first of all? So actually, let's step back. Am I still in that camp? Yes. From the longer-term perspective, until I see a dramatic change in voters or society's attitude towards spending, I'm going to continue to believe that the surprises will be with them continuing to spend more, not less. So I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm still in that camp. And in fact... I think that since we spoke last three, I would argue that it's gotten even worse for, not worse, there's the chance of more inflation has gone even up more, even more, because one of the things that we have forgotten is that we have never tried to do this much fiscal. And so every time we've tried to do monetary policy, it hasn't worked, or recently, every time we've tried to do monetary stimulus, it hasn't worked. Because the reality is that lower rates doesn't encourage anyone to spend when they're constrained by balance sheet constraints, right? Like if you're sitting there and you're somebody that's got a big mortgage and your house is underwater and you're up to your eyeballs on, in, in debt and they low, the government lowers their, their you know, interest rate, it doesn't mean that you're going to go out and take any more debt. So you end up getting to this point where monetary policy becomes impotent. Now, What's happened is that the government this time, instead of trying to do fix everything with monetary like they did in 2008, this time they did fiscal. But by doing fiscal, they've improved the consumer's balance sheet tremendously. And one of the things that I, I'm concerned about is that people are missing the private sector credit creation side of the equation because it's been gone for the past, let's say since 2006 ever since the great financial crisis, we haven't had 
any real ability to make any private sector credit creation because everyone's, it's, it's been too tough. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. So what happens if we get a situation where we have the government spending more, we have the, the central banks keeping interest rates low because they promise flexible average inflation targeting, and we get a surprise private sector credit creation, meaning when the millennials in the U.S. start going and buying houses, they start spending whatever. A lot of times you don't know where it comes from. It just kind of seems to come. And so I think that there's a greater chance than, than the market realizes that we have sustained inflation that is way more difficult to get rid of than, than the central banks believe. And I, and, I, and I do believe that. Now, the next thing is, how do you play that? My one trade that I've just been adamant about that I've almost never touched is inflation break-evens. And what is inflation break-evens? Well, if you go buy a tips, what you, you get with a tip is you get um, a guaranteed interest rate plus inflation. So it's almost like a nominal bond plus inflation. So inflation break-evens are what is implied through those tips when you compare them to the nominal bond. I have, um, for a long time, the bonds were implying inflation that was well below the Fed's target. And over the last kind of few months, they've really rallied, meaning that inflation break-evens have gone up. And to do those trades, basically what I do is I own tips, and then I'm short government bonds against it. So I duration match it. So I buy the tips, and then I get rid of the interest rate component by shorting the equivalent government thing. And then what I'm left with is just an inflation uh, kind of stream. Now, for the people with ISDES, they would go and trade inflation swaps, but in essence, they're almost the same thing, very similar. The two follow each other. I have, for the first time, sold those, and I sold them a week or two ago when I saw Jack Dorsey talking about hyperinflation. And to me, this was really scary because when I used to get on TV show, shows or podcasts and start talking about inflation, everyone told me I was an idiot. Like, they, you don't know what you're talking about. We're never going to have inflation. I hear about the three, the triple Ds all the time, debt, demographics, and disinflation from technologies. And I used to hear about this all the time. All the, like, people just, you know, say, you know, your theory makes sense, but there's no way it's going to happen because of all these things. I always argued that those three things were just influences that made it harder to create inflation, but that if a government wanted to, they could always create inflation. And I think we finally hit a point where the government was willing to do enough that we created the inflation, we started to realize, you know, that that this is how the actual modern monetary system works. Now, what happened though, unfortunately, was that we've gone from not believing we've created inflation to this kind of hysteria that we had in the late October, with Jack Dorsey doing it, we had the crude oil running, we had all sorts of talk about this. So the inflation break evens went way up. I actually sold them. But I'm looking to get back in because I think that it's kind of died down and we've, and we've done it. Um, it ends up being more complicated because there's the various parts of the curve of inflation, meaning that just like there's a yield curve, there's an inflation curve. And so what you had was a situation where the market believed we would have inflation for two or five years. And so those were trading at much more elevated levels than 30 years. To me, the next move is going to be a shifting back to the point where they start to realize that the risk is that longer term inflation goes up. And so therefore, for me, the, the best trade out there is to be long inflation break-evens at the 10 to 30 year point of view. And the way you do that is you go out and you buy those tips and you short the nominal bonds. Yep. And would you, would you argue, uh, so what do you think of the argument that what we saw during COVID was sort of a one-time increase in government spending. And so if government spending stays elevated, but you know, doesn't grow so fast anymore, we won't see inflation rise. Because would it, would it, isn't is inflation sort of the rate of change in, uh, in prices as opposed to, you know, the absolute level of prices itself? So, you know, we are, so are you expecting government spending to continue you know, growing really quickly? So, yes. Yeah, so that, that's the old stock versus the flow argument. And, the, and I did kind of... <laughs> I worried about that, Shri, that I said, I said to myself, we're having a reduction of what's expected from the government spending. And I thought that maybe that would be enough to cause things to come in, and it's not. Uh, I don't think the market truly believes that we're going to have inflation yet. 
I, I, I think that they're skeptical. And if you think about the past 40 years, ever since Volcker, you know, broke the back of inflation, it's been nothing but down in terms of interest rates and inflation. Yep. So even though people were scared about inflation this summer and early fall, they never really believed that we were going to have a problem with long-term inflation. As evidenced by what the inflation swaps or the break-evens did, if they were worried about long-term inflation, they would be buying 30-year inflation swaps and selling twos and fives. Yet the exact opposite happened. They went and they bought twos and fives, and then they so the, nobody bought the 30s, so the 30s didn't move as much. So in terms of this argument that this is a one-off, I also don't believe that's the case because if you look at the, let's say the, the trend upon which the, uh, my, my buddy Marco Popich uh, from Geopolitical, he wrote this great book, Geopolitical yep. Alpha. Uh, he has, a, he has a, a concept that he talks about the median voter. Yep. And he says the median voter is a what- the left. He, well, yeah, and, and, and he says, that's what you need to watch. And, and I do believe that the median voter is shifting, um, yes, I guess you could call it left or, or, or willing to spend, they're shifting younger. Uh, and, and I think we've had a change in attitude. And so I, I, don't, I don't see any signs that we're getting religion about trying to balance the government books. And yes, over the short run, we could have a disappointment uh, versus what the market's built in, but that's over the short run. Over the long run, I continue to see um, more and more spending. And I almost go, I, I remember Bill Fleckenstein came up with this great line. He says, the government's going to keep spending until the bond market takes the keys away. And that's, that's I, I tend to agree with them. And it's going to get even more complicated if the Fed keeps, you know, rates sh short at the, the I mean, sorry, low at the short end. Yep. And so to me, I just don't see the, the signs out there that we're going to get a, a huge pullback in spending. And I think that what well, you have to be careful because Wall Street generally runs to the right and they generally want to see that. They think that that's, they all remember Reagan, Thatcher, and they all have these great views and they're mostly supply siders. So they, they want to do that and, and, and they get all upset about it when it doesn't happen. But you always have to ask yourself, uh, do you want to trade the market that you, you know, that you, you think should it be or the market that is? And I always say trade what is as opposed to what you think should be. And uh, I, I, that would be the counsel I'd give there. I just don't see the signs that we're about to change tact. And listen, if I'm wrong and, I, and all of a sudden Tea Party gets elected and we start balancing books, I'll change my tune. But for now, I don't see yep. it. Moving on, I wanted to talk a bit about energy markets. And, you know, you've sort of been talking about oil. And um, and so could you sort of just uh, give us your thesis on oil and sort of how you're playing it? Sure. Uh, so I, I, I've been bullish on oil and, and nat gas for a while. I probably didn't do a good enough job hammering it home in terms of, uh, you know, saying how bullish I was on it. But to me, it seemed very clear that the ESG movement uh, it was starving companies, uh, uh, energy companies of capital for exploration. And when you starve, you know, a company of capital for exploration and you have a situation where demand doesn't go down, that means there's going to be less supply. And I think it was just that simple. And the part that kind of fascinates me is that what did these politicians think were going to happen when we cut back on the on, on on how much these companies were going to spend in terms of finding new oil? Like it, it's just flabbergasts me that anyone is shocked that it's gone up, and it flabbergasts me even more that they're, they're begging OPEC to pump. Like, isn't this what we want? Isn't this like if you are trying to change behavior, you have to do it through higher prices? You're not going to change behavior by, by not raising the price of something. And my analogy I always gave was it was like Nancy Reagan when they, when they decided to do their war on drugs. 
So they did their war on drugs in the, in the early 80s, I believe. And what they thought what they should do is they should put all the drug dealers in jail. So they went hard after all these drug dealers. And what happened was that you, you got a situation where, sure, they pulled some drugs off the street, so they decreased the supply, but it didn't change the demand. There was still all the same demand, so the price of drugs just went up. And to me, there's no difference uh, with oil and energy. Um, it seems to me, unless you change consumers' behavior, then you need to, uh, you're going to have higher price. And in fact, it gets even more complicated than that. If you're trying to transition your economy to a green economy, that actually means that you're going to be using more oil or more energy, let's say, more energy as you do that, because you need to make extra you know, infrastructure. So we not only shouldn't be cutting back on terms of our exploration and our, and our uh, kind of usage of, of fossil fuels, we have the energy needed to create the green economy that we want on the other side. And to go and move over to a green economy before the infrastructure is in place is just asinine. Like it's just, anyways, it, it just it just boggles my mind that 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 politicians were this dumb. Well, I shouldn't boggle my mind, but it does that they were this dumb. And I I look at these stocks and I still think that they're cheap. I still think they're going to be like the uh, the Philip Morris, uh, the Altrias of the world. And if you look back at those those tobacco stocks, they were some of the best performing stocks forever because most people couldn't own them. And they had, they just paid back the money, you know, in terms of dividends and they were some of the best performing stocks out there. And I fully suspect that that's what's going to happen in the energy. You're going to get energy stocks that are yielding, you know, five to 10% and, and covering their dividends. And it's going to be uh, just something that's, that's, that's an investment that's great. And, and the reality is it's because most big accounts can't own it. Yep. Like, you know, Sri, you and I, I'm a UAT alum and you're a U at UAT. I saw recently that they're, they're yeah. selling all their, they're divesting, their yeah. energy stocks. <laughs> at least they waited till this long. Like, so at least they're going to get a little bit better price because they rallied. They didn't sell into the hole at least, but I, I it, it just seems absolutely, um, crazy to me and, it, and it's pretty clear that the the more they dig in and and refuse to change the supply without changing the demand the more the higher it's going to go and then my final point is that i always talk about this but uh i think that we've under greatly underestimated the demand side uh china uh is growing and is becoming more and more wealthy and i and i talk about this hockey stick formation of energy, you got energy use per capita. And if you go back into history and you look at Japan when they came out of World War II, and what you'll see is it looks like this in terms of the energy use. It goes up, up a little bit, and then it explodes when they hit a certain level of, of income. And you see that in Japan, you see that in Korea in the 70s and 80s. And I think that we're about to see that in China. And so I suspect that even though they are working really hard on trying to move to electrical because they realize that they're kind of screwed when it comes to uh, uh, fossil fuels. I still think that their demand is gonna be monstrous. We also have India. Uh, India could very easily you know, uh, surprise us all on the demand side. So I, don't, I just don't see the um, fossil fuels going away anytime. And I think that these stocks are gonna be great performers. Yep. And you know, uh, Harris Kupperman, Guppy, you know, he has a joke where he says that, you know, ESG stands for energy stops growing. And, you know, one thing that he's been very bullish on has been uranium. And, you know, he's been on your podcast to talk about it. And, you know, well, what are your thoughts on the uranium bull cycle compared to the last one in 2006? And, you know, were you actually on that bull cycle? Uh, yeah, no, I, I didn't get it like Cuppy. The Cuppy got the, the 2006 bull cycle like nobody's business. Uh, <laughs> one of the things that scares me about, about uranium for a little while there, I got nervous because my rolling bubble thesis almost seemed to be playing out. It went from everyone hated it to the craziest everyone was in. Guys are changing their avatars to yellow laser eyes. Scares the bejesus out of me when I see things like that. I walked away for a little bit. Having said that, I, I'm been picking away again. I do think that over the long run, 
this is one of the, at least part of the solution in terms of how we figure out how to move to electricity. And I see China just announced they're doing 150 new plants. Uh, I think it's just a matter of how you play it and, and just be careful about the timing of it. But it is something to me that you need to own. Yeah, but do you think that it's sort of gone too fast, too far? Because usually the explanation that, you know, people uh, people provide is that, you know, the boom and bust cycles for uranium tend to be far more volatile compared to, I guess, the average boom and bust cycle. So do, do, you, do you think it's uh, it's starting to go too far, too fast? Or do you think, you know, this is just the way it, they, the way it really should be? So if you think about, we're still barely above the cost of production. Yep. It's, it's not like we've gone that far. Uh, I don't know about the stocks. I'm scared about some of the smaller stocks. To me, I think you just own Cameco and, and just, I know that they're expensive and that they're not the, the one with the more torque and, and yeah, so on and so on. But the reality is that for big accounts, that's the only real trade. That's the only thing that can really trade out there. So if, they're, if you're going to get uh, a move to this, and I do think there's a chance that real accounts are able to buy this because they can't go buy fossil fuels. We know that the, the Ontario teachers and the UTs and the CalPERS and, the, yep. and all those, those the, they can't buy them, but they can buy probably uranium stocks because that's part of the solution to this, to the energy issue is not part of the problem. And for them, they're going to buy the biggest one and they're going to, they're not going to care that it's expensive versus some crappy, you know, smaller tiered one. And they're going to own that. So to me, I, I think you just own Cameco and, and you, even though it's expensive and you, even though it has some issues with the mind stuff and you just count on the, the, the flow of funds amongst the portfolio managers skating you on side and you don't, worry about the relative. Now, in terms of you're asking about the, the, the violence of it, I don't think we're there yet, Sri. Like we're like, this thing's just started. Like yeah. it could get a lot more dumb. Uh, if you think back to the violence of where it was last time, I can't remember what the number was, but it was, you know, a couple hundred bucks or something didn't uranium go to, yeah. it, was, it was way up there. So I, I, I'm, not, I'm not worried about that portion of, I mean, that, that side of it yet. I do think though you just from a trader's perspective that it goes through periods where it's might be more uh, more frothy than others. And you know, if you're like for me, I, I'm I try to be a little more nimble and and I and I waited and as I told you, I, the the best signal was to me was when the yellow laser eye guys went away. When they took their their lit yellow laser eyes off, I was like, okay, it's safe to buy again. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And so, you know, I wanted to jump from here and talk about, I guess, what you could call the macro trend. And so a while back, you know, you were talking, uh, you, you published an article called The World Flattener Day, and uh, where you talked about, you know, how yield curves all over the world were sort of getting really flat. And, and so number one, what's your view on the US dollar uh, relative to other currencies? So, so the thing about effects is that it's a relative game. And so, you know, you can't just go the USD, uh, the, uh, the US is printing, therefore the US dollar is about to collapse. Well, you know, everyone, uh, you know, all central banks are doing that. So, uh, so how are you thinking about your, the USD currencies in general? And how are you thinking about, you know, uh, bond, yield, bond yields and yields curve going, uh, and the yield curve going forward? Okay, Sri, you managed to find another pet peeve of mine. So I see people that talk about the uh, interest rate differential and they think that this drives FX. And the problem with it is that they think it drives it almost to the sole exclusion of everything else. And I contend that it drives it a whole lot less than everyone believes. Like we're in Canada and the US dollar, you know, will have a spread uh, to the, in terms of interest rates to the US, dollar, yep. uh, US banks. And if you think about it, let's imagine that the Bank of Canada gets more hawkish and the Bank of Canada gets, raises 25 basis points. So let's just say that we get 25 basis points ahead of the Americans on a th three month, or let's say one year paper. So we get, you know, 25 basis points. Think about how much volatility there is in the USD um, Canada rate. Like that 25 basis points is, is, is irrelevant compared to how much it's moving around all the time. 
So to think that interest rate differentials drive FX is, is kind of maddening to me. And I, and I see a lot of people doing it and they'll be like, oh, the Fed's raising, so therefore we're going to have to buy USD. And sometimes it works, but I don't think that people truly understand the different factors. And, and you could get a situation where the Fed actually lowers rates, which makes U.S. equities seem more attractive, which therefore encourages world portfolio managers the world over to buy U.S. equities. It could cause the U.S. dollar to go up. And so there's all sorts of different um, aspects like that. So, and then you got to think about foreign direct investment. And then you got to think about the, the import export, like the actual parts of trade. So foreign exchange is, is difficult in that it's not, it, at times it, it moves based upon different factors. Now, in terms of what my longer term view is and, and when I look at um, the US dollar, I do believe that there is an over uh, owning of US assets, especially stocks. And the reason for that is because they've been the best index in the world, like by a, by a factor of two almost. And so if you're sitting there and you're, you know, European pension plan manager or a Japanese uh, postal, you know, fund uh, manager, you, you have to own U.S. stocks. You have to be overweight. And if you weren't, you probably lost your job because the reality is someone else was overweight them. And one of the things that worries me is that if we ever do get um, a wholesale re-rating of that trade, meaning that the U.S. becomes less attractive that you'll have a US dollar that ends up getting sold for an extended period of time. So when I look at the US dollar and I think about the risks, I think there's a lot more risk on the downside than there is on the upside. And just kind of from a longer term perspective, up until COVID, the US was the only country with positive real yields. Real yields are the yields after inflation. So you had positive real yields there. You had a, a stock market that was doing by far the best mm -hmm. and it attracted a lot of capital. And if we get a situation where like right now, real yields in the US, I just looked this morning and uh, the 30 year uh, US real yield, which is the tip yield, it went to a new low, new all time low. It's negative 65 basis points. It starts to look less attractive. And yes, people are still chasing U.S. stocks, but if that ever changes, you'll get a situation where all of a sudden it won't look as good. And so I'm worried that you get a surprise on the downside for the U.S. dollar, not the upside, which is very different than most people. Most people sit around and they're all worried about the kind of deflationary shock that you get this U.S. dollar um, in a kind of rise that, that can't be controlled. And you did see that, for example, in COVID, the, I think the initial move was down, but then it very quickly went up. Yep. And it wasn't until the Fed stepped in and really printed that you saw the US dollar go back down. And to me, I believe that the Federal Reserve will provide the liquidity needed for the US dollar to not go up and if anything, the, the worry would be more that it goes down, not up. Yep. And, and, you know, a while back, not too long back, you know, on Fintry, you know, everyone was sort of commenting on the fact that we're seeing uh, really a really rapid flattening uh, uh, in the yield curve. So do you, do you have any thoughts on that? And could you sort of talk a little bit about the implications of that? If there are any? Sure. Uh, so, yeah. So there was, listen. Lots of excitement over the last couple of weeks in the in the short end of the yield curve. They call them stir traders, short term interest, interest rate, rate traders. Yep. And uh, there's a whole group of hedge funds that not uh, that aren't as well known amongst the kind of the general community. And what these hedge funds do is they specialize in trading that front end, and they will trade some longer end stuff, but they're really really active. In, in carry trades and other trades at the front end. Yep. And their, their strategies are, are 
hugely levered and they got themselves into some problems and then their unwind made short-term rates go up quicker than anyone was expecting. And so I'll just kind of sketch out how it evolved. If you think about the world out there, most people would have believed that the U.S. would lead the tightening cycle, meaning that nobody would really tighten until America tightened. They're, they're the, the world's central bank and nobody really wants to, you know, they, they, they don't want rates higher than the U.S. They want to make sure that they continue to be able to compete in that way. So everyone was putting on trades, assuming that there was going to be no hikes until uh, the taper came off and the taper we all knew was going to take until next summer. So it looked like there was going to be no hikes until next summer. What happened was we had a series of central banks get increasingly hawkish that were non-Federal Reserve banks. So what you saw was Australia got hawkish and they abandoned their, their peg at the, I think it's the three-year level, uh, I mean, tenor. Uh, we saw that the, the uh, Brazil tightened, Poland tightened, Canada tightened. And so you saw these countries, which by the way, were interestingly enough, many of them were commodity-based countries. And, and, and they were tightening because they were seeing uh, inflation due to higher commodity prices. And so they were looking at this and they were getting nervous. And so they got more hawkish. And the, but the trouble was that we had all these levered hedge funds that were assuming that nobody was going to tighten until next summer. And so then they were, they were doing trades that originally seemed great. They were, they were shorting kind of two-year and three-year out uh, futures contracts, and they seemed great. But then what happened was we had these surprise tightenings, and all of a sudden, they were offside. And as they got offside, they had to sell, which caused more pain. And we saw some real moves in the Australian, uh, the, uh, Australian uh, short end. And it was just, I, and I, I pulled it up on the backs, which is the Canadian one. I think that the backs, the second, the second, the eighth contracts, which is like a two-year contract, moved more than it had ever moved, or or was one of the largest single-day moves ever. When the, with when the, at the recent announcement, when the when the Bank of Canada governor got more hawkish, and so there was this massive unwind at the front end of the curve. It was massive. These guys, these hedge funds that usually go up and down 1%, we're losing 10, 15% a month, and they just tapped out. And this caused, this unwind caused a huge amount of dislocation at the front end of the curve. You saw the two year note going to, uh, what it made it up to 60 basis points. I think earlier it had been 10 or something. It was a huge move on the two year. You saw um, contracts that, really shouldn't be priced in with any hikes were, were priced in with hikes because the, these guys were all selling it. And so the long and short of it is it was, it was a function of these levered hedge fund um, traders putting on positions that were assuming that the market wouldn't tighten until the Federal Reserve tightened. And when we saw banks throughout the world get hawkish, there was, in essence, a, a, a huge tapping out of risk. Yep. And ultimately, it ended when the Bank of England, which had also gotten hawkish and also signaled that they were going to tighten, they passed. And the funny thing about it is a lot of those trades that these guys had on would have been fine, but they couldn't stick through it because the Bank of England at first said, look, said, looked like they were gonna tighten, then they didn't tighten. And so the, you had these contracts rip back up and then you had also Federal Reserve uh, Chair, Chair Powell come on and he indicated that they were gonna hang tough and there was gonna be no change in plans. So you had almost a collective tapping out of the short end but I don't think that it really truly meant anything uh, in terms of actual change in policies. Now, the other thing I wanna say, Sri, is that on the long end, 
So we talked about why the short end went up in yield. On the long end, it was, it was amazing because the exact opposite was happening. Along the, while this was occurring and while the, the short end was going up in yield, down in price, we had the long end going up in price and down in yield. And everyone's like, what the hell? Why is that going on? I contend that it had to do with the fact that back to my inflation scares, if you go look at the Bank of America had this um, survey that they did with, the, with the, uh, the big pension funds, they were as short as they'd ever been in terms of duration and in terms of being bearish on bonds. So at the same time that we had everyone puking at the short end, we had all these hedge, I mean, real money buying the long end. So we had, we had the leveraged hedge fund guys selling all the front end, and then we had the real money long-term yep. guys buying the long end. And that's what I think is happening with the flat ending, flattening of the curve. The more interesting point is, is the flattening of the curve telling you something? Is the, mar- is the bond market correct? And does this mean that they're anticipating future growth to be slower? Mm-hmm. And I would contend, no, it's not. The bond market is all sorts of confused. It's having trouble dealing with all the QE. It's having trouble dealing with the secular change from disinflation to inflation. And I think it presents an opportunity, not a signal, an opportunity to go the other way. So for me, I had been, uh, I had stepped out of the way of the steepeners when I started to realize that I didn't, um, when I started worrying about the violence of some of the moves early on, when I saw some things in Australia, I was like, oh, geez, like uh, Australia was one of the first. I said, if this can happen, it could get a lot worse. But so I stepped out of the way. I, I, but generally I love steepeners because I believe in inflation. And I think that you should start looking at them again down here. Got it. Got it. And I've got one more big question to ask you. And just a few weeks back, there was a lot of ex- excitement about uh, Evergrande Day in, uh, in China and, Everyone is talking a lot about this entire Chinese real estate bubble or just the Chinese bubble as a whole, you know, collapsing. So do you have any thoughts on uh, what's going on in China, uh, especially with Evergrande? And, you know, Evergrande seemed to be one of those things that, you know, everyone got really excited about and they were hyping up, you know, China's Lehman yeah. moment. You know, we're going to see you know, everything collapse. And, you know, at the end, you know, it was, eh, nothing happened. So do you, do you have any thoughts on what's going on in China? So um, three, I, I actually... Going into the Evergrande kind of decline, because don't forget the U.S. stock market followed it lower. I was bearish for three reasons. I was bearish for, uh, no, sorry, I was bearish for two reasons. And then I said the third wasn't a big deal. So my two that I was bearish about were the fact that I thought fiscal was getting cut back. And then B, I thought that we were going to get more monetary hawkishness. So I thought those two things were going to cause risk assets to go down and then when we had the Evergrande situation, it got really sketchy and everyone got really scared about the markets. And, and I wrote this piece saying Evergrande is not going to cause a collapse. And, I, and I'm going to tell you why China is different than the U.S. China is different because they are not a market economy. Like, it, 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 yes, they have elements of market-based economy, but at the end of the day, if President Xi says, go lend to the, to the borrowers, it gets done. Think back to the great financial crisis where we had Lehman going bankrupt over the weekend and the Federal Reserve desperately trying to figure out somebody that could buy them and stop the collapse. And there was no way they could do it. They couldn't find anyone. They didn't have the legal authority to do it. But President Xi can just tell, tell them. So I always counsel people that to be kind of, uh, like I say, you should be hesitant to assume that what you think will occur in China is what occurred here. They're completely different. They control it much more. So instead of asking, is this going to cause a ripple effect that causes a a contagion in China? The Mm -hmm. better question to ask is, do they want to do more of whatever reforms they're doing. So I look at it differently. I look at it and saying, do they want, do they still have more pain to do? And they're, they're choosing to do this pain. And so when I think about uh, Evergrande, I say that they're doing, uh, they're using this opportunity to reform their real estate. It will affect uh, economic growth. It will make like 
real estate bonds, not a very good investment. It, it, no doubt that, that everyone who owns Evergrande Browns is, is going to get crushed. Many of the other bonds will get crushed as well. But be careful assuming that this flows through and causes all sorts of other problems in China. I take the other side of that trade. And in fact, I'm getting increasingly bullish about China. And let me tell you why. When the great financial crisis came and we had this collapse, the U.S. was not in a position to do any fiscal. They had the Tea Party. There was very little fiscal ability. So they tried to fix everything with monetary policy. They couldn't do it. Uh, and monetary policy, as we know, doesn't really do much to the real economy. China was actually rode to the rescue of the world economy after the great financial crisis by doing a massive amount of fiscal. Fast forward to 2020, we actually had the opposite situation. This time we had the US doing tons of fiscal and China holding back. And then it got even worse recently because what we've had is we've had a rally in all the commodities. Right. So China is being hesitant to do any fiscal because the last thing they want to do is to increase these commodities and create inflation. Because although I don't think they're worried about contagion in real estate, they worry a lot about inflation. Inflation is really what they can't control. That's the problem for them. It's not deflation and implosion is not their problem. Their problem is inflation. So we had a situation where they held back on the fiscal. And in fact, they were trying to, you know, tamp down the commodity rally. They were selling, you know, aluminum and copper. And I think they might, I don't know, I can't remember if they did oil or not, but they, they definitely sold aluminum and copper into the markets to try to slow it down, iron ore. They sold these things into the markets to try to slow it down. And they haven't been doing any fiscal and they've been doing very little monetary. And not only that, we look at it, China has just went in and just announced their greatest trade deficit ever. So even though the world economy is having trouble and there's real problems, they're just making stuff still for the rest of the world like nobody's business. So the reason I am bullish on China is that I look at it and I say, they haven't done any fiscal, they've done very little monetary, they're doing all these reforms that are hurting their economy they have the plenum coming up. The plenum is their political party meeting or whatever. They want to make sure that the economy is humming for next summer. They have the uh, Olympics this winter in February, I believe it is. Uh, one of the problems with the Olympics is they want to make the skies clearer. So they pull back on, on you know, producing iron ore and things like that because they want to make the skies clearer. So to me, it looks like we've hit the point where if we're not there already, we will be there very shortly where there's the minimum amount of Chinese economic stimulus applied yep. because they're trying to pull back. And I look forward, remember the markets are always a discounting mechanism. I look forward and say, what are they going to be doing? They're going to be spending more on the other side of this. And I think that if we ever got a break in commodities, and, and, and I don't know if we're going to get a break in commodities, but if we ever got a break in commodities, I think that they would do, the fiscal would come back out in China. And I think that the only thing holding them back is the, is the commodity run. Yep. So the, to me, that's a, you know, a great trade. And, and listen, one thing you can go look at is KWEB. It's got all those internet stocks that everybody hates because he went through the, and, and President Xi did his reforms on all the technology companies. And he shot them and it looks like they're, they're terrible investments. You just ask anyone how awful they are. To me, they look like they're left for dead and they're starting to perk their heads up. I think that you could wake up and if you buy that thing, you could wake up next, uh, let's say next summer and they could be up 50 cents, 50% 50 without blinking, I think. Wow. Uh, Kev, is there anything that you'd like to cover that we haven't covered just yet? Uh, I'm not, I'm, let me just think. Uh, I'm not sure. Like, uh, I, I would love to hear more about your time at Simplify, though. What is, <laughs> what's been the biggest surprise? Oh, you know, it's, it's well, I guess, number one, uh, still, we're, we're, obviously, I've learned a lot. I would say that the biggest surprise uh, is, you know, how well. So, so Simplify was started uh, sort of at the, at the start of the COVID pandemic. 
Um, and, you know, it is awesome how well, you know, so how well the team works, even though it's remote. And, you know, that's, that's something that's absolutely wonderful. I also think that well, what's wonderful is, um, I, I, well, number one, uh, from Mike Green. So I've learned a lot uh, in terms of stuff like, you know, chaos theory, systems theory, as well as, you know, how he thinks about stuff like inflation and, you know, passive and options. And you know, it's, just, it's just been absolutely wonderful. And so Sri, have you become a, a, a indexing is going to kill us all uh, convert? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I'm on the way there. So <laughs> you're on the way there. And I saw you got to go to New York. Was that your first time or have you been before? So I've been there before back. That was uh, so the last, so the first time I went to New York, that was March, 2018. And I was there pretty much overnight, but so, but this time I was there for almost three days. So it was a lot more fun. And, you know, I, I so you know, I got to run around Times Square and, uh, you know, got to go to the NY, uh, uh, got to go to the NYSC, met, met a whole bunch of awesome people, David Einhorn, oh, that's, Mike Green. So you got to go to the, on the, did you go on the floor or just up to the visit? So we got, so we got to go on the floor. The, on the floor was after hours. So, uh, but, but it was, but it was still awesome. Cause you know, you could still see like all the market maker desks and yeah, sit it down. Uh, that's it, cool. It, it it's incredible. a terrific city, isn't it? Like as much as I love Toronto and listen, New York is just, New York is awesome. it, it, it's, is, like, it's, it's, it's another level. <laughs> Yeah. And, and, and so did you, did they take you out? Did the simplify guys take you out for fancy dinners? They did. And that was, it was incredible. So. That was <laughs> okay. Well, listen, sometime when we meet up, you'll have to tell me all about the, the, the debauchery you guys got up to uh, after hours. <laughs> Absolutely. I will. Thank okay. you so much for being on the podcast, Kev. Uh, thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure, Sri.